It is Monday, February 26th, and this is The National. Tonight, CBC News has learned some of what to expect in tomorrow's budget and why women will be front and centre. A Canadian retailer is under pressure to pull water bottles off their shelves because of the Florida shooting. And he's one of this country's most celebrated actors. Christopher Plummer on Me Too, Kevin Spacey, and being the oldest nominee on the red carpet. Tomorrow, all eyes will be on Parliament Hill as the government unveils its plan on how to spend your money. But is it about boosting the economy, winning votes, or a little bit of both? Tonight, CBC News has learned some key details of the budget, including two big themes. There will be a new approach to government spending with a focus on getting more women into the workplace, including a new parental leave plan. And we have details on an ambitious program that will affect all of you, every Canadian. The federal government will take a big step into tomorrow's budget towards a national pharmacare plan. And let's start there. David Cochran joins me now. Okay, David, what have you learned? Well, you know, Rosie, that shakeup in Ontario politics continued today, and it's probably because of the federal budget. Eric Hoskins quit as provincial health minister and as an MPP today. Tomorrow, it is going to be announced by the federal government that Hoskins will chair a new advisory committee on the implementation of national pharmacare. And it's important to note the wording there, Rosie. This is not a study on the viability of pharmacare or the feasibility of pharmacare. It's on the implementation of pharmacare. So this is something the Liberals are signaling that they intend to do, maybe, I'm told, as soon as next year's budget and Hoskins job will be to find a way for them to do it so, so the committee that he will chair is going to travel the country it's going to consult with medical professionals talk to the provinces talk to the territories to come up with a plan and it's something Rosie that Eric Hoskins has experience with because they expanded drug coverage here in Ontario when he was the minister so that everyone under the age of 25 has free prescription drugs I don't remember the Liberals talking a whole lot about this in the past so what's the political motivation here David yeah Hoskins report the timing of this it's due next year which just so happens to be an election Election year, Rosie. So if you were wondering what the key elements of Justin Trudeau's re-election bid might be, Pharmacare, probably mm. going to be front and center. A and two other things to point out about this. First, this is a sign the Liberals are at a point in this mandate where they're ready to at least partially move on from delivering on old promises to highlighting new ones. And second, Pharmacare has been a core promise of the NDP for years, and the Liberals have been deliberately trying to barge in on the NDP turf to capture more and more of that left-of-center progressive vote. So pushing forward a national Pharmacare policy mm absolutely continues that trend, especially when you consider that the new NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh, says that pharmacare will be a core part of his election pitch to Canadians. So once Hoskins delivers his pharmacare plan, we'll be able to see if it's good policy. But right now, it sure looks like good politics, at least for the federal liberals, Rosie, because I'm not sure how losing their health minister this close to an election <laughs> is good news for the Ontario Premier Kathleen Wynne. No, but puts a squeeze on the federal NDP. You're right about that. David Cochran sure. bringing us some of tomorrow's budget news tonight. Thank you for that. You got it. As we mentioned, women are going to be a big part of tomorrow's budget, and CBC News has learned tomorrow the government will pledge funding for girls and women in sports, aiming for gender equality across all levels of sport by 2035. That decision based on data showing 41% of girls aged 3 to 17 don't play sports, and the numbers for adult women are much worse. The government made that decision using something called gender-based analysis. You'll hear a lot about it on Parliament Hill tomorrow, so... Here's how it works. When the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister come down these stairs tomorrow with their budget in hand, it will have been done with the help of gender-based analysis, or as it's known here in Ottawa, GBA. Meaning what exactly? The government looks at its policy decisions to see how they affect men and women differently, and if they aren't fair, how to fix them. Although this government also applies that notion to areas like age, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and Indigenous peoples. The government did attempt this last year, but the difference this time, sources say, is the finance minister and the prime minister made it clear to their colleagues in order to get funding and projects approved, this analysis was required. The why is pretty easy. To grow the economy, which the government wants to do, more people need to be working. One Royal Bank study says getting as many women working as men could boost Canada's economy by 4%. So just how do you do it? Well, the government's attempt at this last year brought things like the Canada Child Benefit, a consolidated tax credit for caregivers, and an extended 18-month parental leave. In this year's budget, look for other things. Money to push women into leadership roles, encouraging them to pick up new training and skills, and trying to get more women into STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. 
The economic arguments for doing this are well documented, but there's another reason too, and that's pure politics. This self-declared feminist prime minister knows that women were part of his key to success in the last election, and they will be in the next one too. And Bill Morneau got a little bit of advice developing tomorrow's budget. Well, a lot. But this piece of advice he got from Sweden. Arnala Ayed traveled to Stockholm to understand their experience in closing the gender gap. When you're this far north, you learn early how to take the edge off the winter. This far north. They've also long pushed to take the edge off inequality. They prioritize the plowing of sidewalks when it snows here because women are more likely to walk or take the bus than men who are more likely to drive. It's the result of so-called gender-responsive budgeting, a way of looking at the landscape of government spending to ensure it's distributed equally. And I think that something that was very challenging or was very difficult to understand 20 years ago is now totally natural. Sweden has never been ranked lower than fifth in the world when it comes to equality. In fact, in the overall picture, it's managed to close the gap between men and women by more than 81 percent. Last year, it was ranked first in the world in terms of the number of female ministers sitting in this parliament, including the finance minister, who agreed to sit with us to talk budgets. Hello, minister. When it comes to governments pushing equality, Almost no tool is more powerful than their budgets. A gender analysis of budget plans is mandatory for all the ministries in Sweden's self-described feminist government. Gender budgeting will never solve the problem if there is not a political will. But a combination of a political will to change society and gender budgeting, then you can do changes. One of the bolder changes, adding a month of parental leave specifically for fathers, that can't be shared, aimed at getting more men to shoulder more of the time away from work. But I think solutions like that, so that we can actually um, make it very easy for people to actually be equal as parents and make it a bit difficult to choose, you know, the maybe easier way out. Uh... Etta's parents have been splitting available leave in half to take care of her. Well, I sort of felt that was my right to do. It's like uh, bringing up a kid in, the, in Sweden today, you have the right to be at home with them. So do these measures work in fostering more equality? Long before the government looked at budgets with a gender lens, the Swedish women's lobby did. And while they do see improvements, they see lots of gaps in income and work conditions, for instance. We have um, analysis of what are the background, the causes for the gaps that we have. Uh, but we are still trying, you know, for that last step, which is like, where are the reforms that are going to close those gaps? So even this far north, even this far ahead of most of the world, there's still much more work to do. Nala Ayed, CBC News, Stockholm. We will have extensive coverage of the Trudeau government's third budget tomorrow afternoon. I will be live in the foyer of the House of Commons starting at 3 Eastern on CBC News Network. And tomorrow night on The National, Andrew, Chantal and Althea will be here for a special Budget Day edition of that issue. I'll also sit down with the finance minister. So lots of coverage of the budget here tomorrow, Ian. We look forward to that, Rosemary. Thank you. Let's move on now to the continuing impact of the deadly school shooting in Florida earlier this month. The debate over gun control taking on a surprising new tone in Washington and even having an impact on a Canadian retailer. But let's start in Florida where we saw more raw emotion in the thankful tears of a survivor. I'm so grateful to be here and it wouldn't be possible without those officers and first responders and these amazing Doctors. There's a lot of people to thank for Maddie's life. These guys from the Coral Springs Police Department and the Broward County Sheriff's Department. 
Today, though, other sheriff's deputies were being criticized for apparently staying outside the school while the shooter was still active. Donald Trump called their behavior disgusting. You know, I really believe, you don't know until you test it, but I think I, I really believe I'd run in there even if I didn't have a weapon. Now, brash self-confidence is nothing new for the president, but today, Donald Trump did break from his usual script in a big way, going where he's not gone before on the subject of gun control. Paul Hunter now on what to make of the president's new message. Thank you, everybody. Donald right. Trump's support for guns and for the Thank powerful pro-gun National Rifle Association no is no secret. And there's no bigger fan of the Second Amendment than me, and there's no bigger fan of the NRA. But today, a surprise. Speaking to U.S. state governors, Trump seemed to suggest a pushback against the NRA. You guys, half of you are so afraid of the NRA. There's nothing to be afraid of. And you know what? If they're not with you, we have to fight them every once in a while. That's okay. Hinting that after that shooting in Florida, Trump wants action on gun laws no matter what. He met with NRA leaders just yesterday. And I said, fellas, we got to do something. It's too long now. We got to do something. But will he? Trump made no mention today of banning guns like the one used in Florida, nor of raising the minimum age for owning them. But he did pledge stronger background checks on buyers and on that infamous device used in the Las Vegas shooting last year, the one that ramps up the killing power of semi-automatics. Bump stocks, we're writing that out. I'm writing that out myself. I don't care if Congress does it or not. I'm writing it out myself, okay? Trump also restated support for armed security inside schools. Arming a small portion that are very gun adept. Prompting one governor today to fire back. I've listened to the first grade teachers that don't want to be pistol packing first grade teachers. So I just suggest we need a little less tweeting here, a little more listening, and let's just take that off the table and move forward. Trump's unexpected push for action on guns now moves to Capitol Hill with meetings there on Wednesday. And a question few would have predicted for this president. How far will he go on gun control? Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Outrage over the Florida shooting is having an impact in this country. Tonight, a national retailer is weighing demands that it clear some products from its shelves because of connections to a major gun maker. Briar Stewart looks at what might be a movement in the making. For years, Richard Campbell has been pushing for better cycling routes in Metro Vancouver. But for the past week, he's been posting on something else, pressuring a company he's loyally supported for three decades. This is something I, I can do to support the, uh, the great work that the students from Parkland and lots of others in, in the states are doing. Mountain Equipment Co-op has more than 20 stores across the country. Its customers are co-op members, and many of them have taken to social media, calling for the retailer to pull products from its shelves. The brands under scrutiny include water bottle maker Camelback, Bale, which makes helmets and goggles, and Giro, which makes cycling gear. The connection between all these seemingly innocuous products, parent company Vista Outdoor, which acquired the brands in recent years. The U.S.-based conglomerate also manufactures ammunition and guns. Its brand, Savage Arms, makes semi-automatic rifles, similar to the weapon used in the school shooting in Florida. On its website, Vista Outdoor lists the NRA as one of its partners. I, I would like to see them say, hey, Vista, if you don't drop your support of the NRA, we're going to uh, stop selling your products. All of those tweets and emails got Mountain Equipment's attention, and today senior leadership met to discuss just what they should do. Experts say it's a dilemma because part of the retailer's brand is about being ethical and showing leadership. This is a challenge for organizations when you have mission, vision, and value statements. You need to walk the talk, and they are being challenged to do so. Today, the co-op said it was consulting its suppliers, adding it's heard a variety of views from customers. I think they should stop stocking the brand because it's inconsistent with our Canadian values. Would I still support MEC if they still continue to offer that? I think so, yeah. Officials say they also heard from those who want to be able to keep buying the products in its stores. So Mountain Equipment Co-op will have to decide what its values really are. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. 
And Andrew, let's move on to another story with the BC Connection, the continuing controversy surrounding the leader of Vancouver-based rock band Headley. Yeah, Ian, their uh, show went on tonight in Quebec City, but not exactly as planned. There was no opening act, and some fans just didn't show. They're still on tour, though, despite being besieged by accusations of sexual misconduct over the past few weeks. And yesterday, a new allegation, a woman told CBC News she was sexually assaulted by lead singer Jacob Hogard two years ago. Jayla Bernstein is in Quebec City tonight, hearing how fans have taken it all in. A slow trickle of Headley Faithful streamed into the Quebec City show. Despite the latest allegations against frontman Jacob Hogard, he still has a support of dedicated fans. When you saw the, the allegations have come to light, you know, and I don't know if you saw, but last night more allegations came forward, another woman came forward okay. anonymously. Did, no. did that make you pause at all? No, no, not at all. I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm, the, I'm, I'm here for the music I'm not here for. And there's nothing, I mean, nothing has been said yet. I mean, they, there's a lot of things that's been said, but we don't know if it's true. The power of their song, it's very important for me because uh, they have helped me, gone through some really rough time in the high school. So just listening to this song, I felt better. Hogard denies all allegations and says everything he did with the latest woman to come forward was consensual. At this time, it's a trial by Twitter. It's uh, Facebook, Twitter, only nothing proven. Some fans with special VIP passes in hand said allegations or not, they don't care. They want their shot at meeting the band. What are you going to use that time to talk to them for? What are you going to say to them? Just say thank you for their music. That kind of loyalty is expected, says this Canadian correspondent for Billboard. She says in the entertainment industry, people often separate the art from the person. I'm not surprised because we're talking thousands of people from all walks of life, different ages, they've paid for the tickets and charges haven't been laid, so maybe they're like, might as well go, what am I going to do with the tickets anyway? Though there was a lot of talk today about this being a trial by Twitter, many fans here say even a police investigation wouldn't shake their faith in the band. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Quebec City. Now, if it weren't for the controversy, Halifax band Neon Dreams would have been on stage in Quebec City tonight, too, as Headley's opening act. It's one of three bands that have backed out of the tour since the allegations surfaced. And band members there have been dealing with angry fans ever since. One thing that I've really taken away from this is we've had a lot of backlash from, from, from Headley fans because of the fact that we pulled out. And it, it's given me a lot more insight into the courage that it takes to come out as a victim because there, there, there is a lot of backlash there. Headley's managers and publicists have now cut ties with the band. There are also some new developments tonight at the Ontario Legislature. Patrick Brown is out again. The former PC leader is now abandoning his campaign to retake the reins of the party. We'll look at where that leaves the Tories, Brown and his fight to clear his name. And stepping in as a last-minute replacement could earn him another Academy Award. I sit down with Christopher Plummer to talk about how the Me Too movement created an opportunity for the oldest ever Oscar nominee. Plus, a little later, I'll take you inside the incredibly competitive and lucrative world of professional gaming with a Canadian star who's kind of a big deal. How would you describe this life that you've carved out for yourself? Pretty chill. We are playing video games for a living, so it's kind of like a dream job in a way. But it's a job. Yeah, that's where the stress comes in. In Ontario, a dramatic twist late tonight that could impact the upcoming provincial election. Patrick Brown quit the race for the leadership of the Progressive Conservatives. His exit comes a month after he actually resigned the job amid uh, sexual misconduct allegations and on the same day that Brown became the subject of a new investigation. Ron Charles now on where this leaves the leadership race. His will likely go down in Ontario history as the shortest candidacy in an already bizarre leadership race. Bizarre because 11 days ago, Patrick Brown entered the race that was originally called to replace him as leader. He resigned last month amid sexual misconduct allegations. 
Caroline Mulrooney came out last week calling on Brown to do the right thing and drop out for the sake of the party. Tonight, she said she is relieved he has heeded that call. I'm sure there was a very difficult decision for him to take, but I believe he took the right one for the party. The latest turn in this roller coaster leadership race caught this Brown supporter by surprise. He's not out, is he? Yes, he is. He's out. He went out? Yeah. yeah. When? I was reading today yeah, in the no, paper no, that he was done. leading. He's done. No. Oh, my God. I'm sad to say that. I really am. I'm sad. Brown gave his reasons for pulling out in a four-page statement. He said he had to choose between fighting the allegations and fighting an election, writing, you cannot shoot on two nets at the same time. He also noted that for some in the PC party, his candidacy had become a source of distraction from the real goal of beating the Liberals. And he wrote of political adversaries collaborating with the media through an endless supply of rumors and innuendo, leading to attacks on his friends, family members, even business partners. Brown's move comes hours after Ontario's Integrity Commissioner announced a probe into Brown's finances based on a complaint from a Tory caucus member. Brown is out as a leadership candidate, but his statement suggests he plans to run as the PC candidate in his riding. It will be up to the winner of the leadership race to decide if that's going to happen. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. And still ahead tonight on The National, they train like athletes, get paid full-time salaries, and draw in millions of fans. We'll take a close look at the future of professional gaming for the Canadian star in L.A. But first, I sit down with Christopher Plummer. We talk about Me Too, his Oscar nomination, and getting older. So the headline was Christopher Plummer, oldest to be nominated for an Academy Award. How does that feel to have the word oldest and Christopher Plummer in the same headline? I'm crazy about oldest. I wish they'd <laughs> shut up and not yeah. use that anymore. Tonight on The National, we are waiting to see what happens in Syria's eastern Ghouta region after Russia ordered a pause in fighting. Starting in a couple of hours, the Syrian government's assault on the rebel-held area is supposed to stop for five hours every day to allow trapped civilians to leave. This after days of escalating clashes. According to one monitoring group, more than 500 people have been killed in just over a week. Nearly 400,000 civilians believed to be trapped. In Toronto, two convicted killers learned that they'll be spending at least the next 45 years behind bars. Dellen Millard and Mark Smitch were sentenced to life in prison for killing Laura Babcock, but they'll serve that time after they've served 25 years for killing Tim Bosma. Babcock's father said justice had been served. In a bizarre way, we are saddened that the trial is over, for it's kept the memory of Laura fresh in everyone's mind. Of course, she will always be in the forefront of ours. Babcock was 23 when she went missing. Her body was never found. Millard and Smith will be eligible for parole in the year 2063, when both men are in their 70s. Oh, terrifying look inside a passenger bus that was involved in a major crash last night on a British Columbia highway. It happened on the Coquihalla near Hope. 29 people were taken to hospital, some of them in critical condition. Two buses and two semi-trailers were caught up in that chain reaction crash. The RCMP says the winter weather was a factor. Canadian actor Christopher Plummer has achieved an almost mythic status on stage and screen. And this Sunday, he could achieve something unique as the oldest person to ever win an Academy Award for a second time. We'll hear from him in just a moment, but first, a look at an extraordinary career. Close up now on a star of Stratford. He's Christopher Plummer, actor. I'm not like my father. I just do this for laughs. Christopher Plummer has been charming audiences for more than 65 years. My little bird twittering out there. On the stage, he's a titan. Now my charms are all off thrown. On the big screen, a legend. Edelweiss, Edelweiss. He's always been in demand, but at the age of 80, he began his Oscar renaissance. I've never stopped loving you. Of course. 
But God knows you don't make it easy. In 2010, a Best Supporting Actor nomination for The Last Station. What kind of music's that? Probably house music. Yeah. House music. <laughs> okay. Two years later, at the age of 82, Plummer finally heard those magical words. And the Oscar goes to... Christopher Plummer, Beginners. You're only two years older than me, darling. Where have you been all my life? Now at 88, he's nominated a third time. I have no money to spare. Plummer was surprised to get an urgent call from Ridley Scott, the director of All the Money in the World. Scott asked him to replace Kevin Spacey in the role of J. Paul Getty after sexual misconduct allegations against Spacey led to him being ousted from the Hollywood spotlight. Plummer's scenes were reshot in just nine days. I sat down with him near his winter home in Florida to talk about the film, his last-minute role, and this year's Academy Awards. So it's a real honor to get to meet you, to get to sit down with you. Oh, uh, and I don't you. even know where to begin, but I think in Variety, just a few weeks ago, the headline was Christopher Plummer, oldest to be nominated for an Academy Award. How does that feel to have the word oldest and Christopher Plummer I'm in the same headline? I'm crazy about oldest. I wish they'd <laughs> shut up and not yeah. use that anymore. I'm going to prove that I can start all over again. But it is nice to have a kind of every 10 years as a new career. <laughs> And uh, to be my age and, and suddenly getting more scripts and more offers than I, than I did when I was in the last decade, it's extraordinary. And I, I'm not going to win this time, obviously not. But um, listen, being nominated is extraordinary. And the funny part of it is I just barely finished the movie and what? suddenly I'm nominated for a Golden Globe. I, mean, I said, wait a minute, guys, I haven't left the set yet. Well, let's talk about all of that. First of all, getting the call to, I don't know what you want to call it, be a last-minute fill-in, replacement, star. What was it like when, when you got that phone call? What was said, and how hard was it to convince you to do it? Ridley, whom I've always wanted to work with, and Ridley never, never, never hired me at all for anything, but I was very anxious to work with him. He, and there he was on the phone saying, I'm coming over. He came all the way over from London, and did you know what was going on? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. But I, had, I didn't relate it to me at all. It hadn't. And then he brought, brought it up. He said, do you want to do this? And he said, you know you were one, one of my first choices for the part. I said, God, that's news to me. Ridley, thank you very much. <laughs> but I said, I'm going to have to read it. So he said, well, hurry up, <laughs> because we're, we were dangerously in need of finishing this, otherwise it'll I'll have to shelve the whole bloody thing. So I went home and read it, and two days later I was in England shooting. Was it daunting at all to consider walking into a role like this at the last minute in a movie that had already been shot? Oh, no, I, I rather, you see, I like risks. I like taking risks. It was kind of wonderful, and I became very fond of Ridley, because he has a wonderful sense of humor very sardonic. That helped relax me, in, indeed. Of course it was scary, but it was also fun, because we laughed all the time, probably out of fear, but, but we had a wonderful time. I did anyway, I hope he did. This may seem like a naive question from a non-actor, but when you play a, the richest man in the world, when you play a multi-billionaire, and you have, that character has the power that he has, do you feel any of that when you're playing the role? Oh, of course you do. You know, all the, the arrogant part of me <laughs> as a ball. <laughs> and of course, the, you know, we're all full of different personalities. And I've played so many kings in my life, don't forget, that uh, it's, n it's not too difficult to switch down to a powerful billionaire. Have you ever had an acting experience like that before? Yes, in, in the theater it happens more, you know, but not on film. Oh, good God, no. And the cost is so enormous. It, it costs $10 million to, to just finish the movie. And you know, we mentioned cost and the speed with which this happened. One of the big storylines was about how much various actors got paid to, to reshoot scenes and the difference between uh, Michelle Williams and, uh, and Mark Wahlberg. What's your view of that discrepancy? Well, I can't really comment on that. I have nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just think it was sad because Michelle was interested in doing more because she had some ideas of improving it, you know. So, so I don't wanna, I'm going to stay out of that mess. 
you are such a distinguished actor in both theater and movies and and have I'm sure so much respect within your industry and and now as you see this moment in time though and you play a role that is so wrapped up into the changes that have happened with me too how do you view all that do you feel like you have a responsibility to speak to that issue or to stay away from it what's your view well I mean what am I going to say I just, other, other than I think it's great that these women can, can now come forward and feel, feel that they're supported in order to come forward. I stay away from it, thank you very much. <laughs> but I, I, I do approve of it, the Me Too theme. The Me Too theme, of course, has, has, has really uh, grown in, in just the last few months. But as you look over the last few decades, before Me Too became a, a trending hashtag, were changes happening within the industry before, or is it really Me Too that has, uh, has elevated th this issue? I think, it's, I think it's simply Me Too. I can't remember anything. And this has been going on, of course, since the time began. This has been going on since the Phoenicians. <laughs> and everybody seems terribly surprised about it. And by this been going on, harassment and, yes, and abuse and that sort of thing? This has been a power play since the world began. Let's talk a little bit about Oscar night. So you're going there assuming, it sounds like feel, feeling pretty strongly you're not going to win, Yes. but you have won. So does that allow you to just savor the night? Oh God, yes. Yes, you sit down, you can actually see your friends and not worry about, oh God, how am I going to think? <laughs> I, I have a little speech prepared in case. Yes. But the awards, as nice as they are, are not the be-all. I mean, the work is mm -hmm. is what we're there for. But for a lot of movie fans, it is the night, right? It is the, the big. It is the Super Bowl of, of so many movie fans, yes. and it's filled with glitter, and it's filled with young, powerful, attractive actors who are trying to make their name. You walk in there at this stage in your career, so comfortable and. Uh, is there any part of you that kind of sits back and, and chuckles when you get somebody's trying to get you to go to this party or trying to suddenly, you know, attach themselves to your rising star? Well, I used to love parties, of course, when I was young. So, and I would have gone to all of these then. I mean, I would, and I would have been the last to leave. And I, I would have been carried out because I love booze too much. Now, I must say, I, I don't stay very long. So what time do you think you're probably going to go to bed Oscar night? Oh, I'll try and go to bed as early as possible. <laughs> I, I, I might go to bed actually in my seat. <laughs> um, and it was a fantastic uh, role you played. You did a great job. And it's, it's a you. real privilege Thank to, to this interview. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So if Christopher Plummer is the oldest ever Oscar nominee and winner, what about the youngest? Well, when it comes to nominees, that title goes to Quaven Janae Wallace. She got the nod for Best Actress at age nine for her moving performance in 2012's Beasts of the Southern Wild. And the youngest ever Oscar winner, Tatum O'Neill. She won the Best Supporting Actress Award at age 10 for her role in Paper Moon alongside her dad, Ryan O'Neill, back in 1974. Okay, still ahead. They train up to 10 hours a day, six days a week, and if they're good, can pull a six-figure salary. Next on The National, what it takes to be at the top of eSports. They have a regimen like any other athlete where they are having scrimmages, they're reviewing game film, they're discussing strategy, they're practicing, they have a nutritionist, they're trying to eat well so that they can be focused. I think it's a good thing to have diversity so that it gets more people to tune into the Olympics in general. So that's Canada's Scarlett Hostin shortly after her big win in Pyeongchang. Only she wasn't competing in an Olympic event. She was battling for galactic domination in StarCraft II, a computer game, at the 2018 Extreme Masters Tournament in South Korea. Now, this was a three-day event streamed on the IOC's official Olympic channel. And that it all unfolded in the run-up to the games themselves? No coincidence. For years, there has been a serious international push to have gaming included as an Olympic sport. And it may surprise you to learn just how close they've gotten. But consider this, eSports Today 
have entire leagues, franchises, sponsors, coaches, news conferences, eight-figure prize pools, hundreds of millions of fans, to the point where they're starting to look an awful lot like traditional pro sports in almost every way. So, tonight, a professional team, a professional league, and a game called Overwatch. We take you inside the world of these modern-day gladiators. All right, guys, who's ready for Overwatch? Hell yeah! Let's get one thing straight right away. If you're not already a gamer, this world is not for you. It's for your kids. Very exciting, I have a good scream right now. Just like at a basketball game or a football game, these fans buy tickets, merchandise, team jerseys. What is this, like like the NBA or the NFL? Like, is this legit? Yeah, my, my own family, my brother's the other, he's like, that's not real sports. I'm like, well, maybe to you, buddy, but we definitely follow it more than the N NBA, NFL, any of that. They're here to take in live one of the most played and watched video games on the planet. No! So why all the hype? Well, Overwatch is a sprawling universe. There are dozens of characters, all with their own backstories. Attackers incoming. At its core, you have two teams of six doing battle across several different arenas, all with a different goal. Capture the objective. Let's do it! Win the most levels, and you win the entire match. Victory. I see it as the people who are the best in the world at something. Right? So whether that is basketball or Overwatch, it is something that takes an incredible amount of skill to be the best at. Rob Moore manages one of the teams, the LA Gladiators. He takes it so seriously because if they win the league championship, the payday is $1 million US. It's legit. It's blinky. It's blinding me. <laughs> there is a level of commitment and skill that is on display. And so if you are somebody who plays video games, the ability to watch the best in the world is something that, that video game players find really exciting. 35 million people around the world play this game. And for the opening week of the league, 10 million viewers. This is a sport with professional broadcasters, commentators, state-of-the-art infrastructure, all part of an industry that took in $1.5 billion last year. Any kid in North America who's between the ages of, you know, 9 and 10 and, and, and high school, all they do is watch YouTube, watch Twitch, they watch these things, and what they're doing is they're watching other people play video games. And make no mistake, where there are young people, there's big money. Consider this. The guy who owns the New England Patriots, he also owns the Boston Overwatch team. And the owners of the LA Rams, they own these guys, the Gladiators. And they're up next. Today we have a choice to be great. Today we have a choice to be a team. Be a team. I know you guys have been working harder than these guys. Let's show it in the match. Who are you siding with when it comes down to the So who are these guys? And how did they get here? Well. It starts bright and early in the morning. The gladiators play together, but live together too. This morning walk, coach's orders, part of the routine. How would you describe this life that you've carved out for yourself? Pretty chill. We are playing video games for a living, so it's kind of like a dream job in a way. But it's a job. Yeah, that's where the stress comes in. Can you get to me now? Lane Roberts plays for LA, but he's from Calgary. He's been playing video games since he was a kid, got really good at them, and now he earns a salary, has benefits, sponsors, and responsibilities. None of these guys seem like morning people to me. I myself am not a morning person. Uh, <laughs> this is his coach, David Pay. Did you guys all eat? Yeah. There's bread and banana bread. I think a lot of people would be surprised that the guys even have a coach for what to a lot of people would look like it's a bunch of guys playing computer games. Yeah, um, I mean, to be honest, it is a bunch of guys playing computer games, but what is basketball, what is soccer? Um, it's just a bunch of guys playing with a ball. Indeed, our Canadian star, better known as Sure4 in the gaming world, he's kind of a big deal. Sure4! 
You see, before the Overwatch League, there was the Overwatch World Cup. Surefour gets Mano with the dead eye. And Surefour helped Team Canada take second place. A minute remaining, but Canada finishes. I've heard you described as Overwatch royalty, like one of the best in the world at what you do in this game. And yet, if I were to walk down the streets of Vancouver and say, hey, did you see Surefour last night? What kind of answer do you think I would get? Who's sure for? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Unless they happen to be a gamer that you just found in the street. Do you think that's going to change? It'll take a while. I guess safe to say you're making like a six-figure salary. Right? I, make, I make a good amount. You make a good amount of money? <laughs> I make a good amount. They have a regimen like any other athlete where they are having scrimmages, they're reviewing game film, they're discussing strategy, they're practicing, they have a nutritionist, they're trying to eat well so that they can be focused. It's all in preparation for game days. Like today. Oh, here we go, Surefour takes one shot, trying to connect with agilities, can't quite do The Gladiators get off to a good start. So good, in fact, they might sweep the other team. Now here comes Faith, gets there just in time to keep up. Gladiators will make it a 2-0 lead in this series. But then their opponents start clawing their way back. Yeah, goodbye, Big Goose. And that is it. We are going to map number five. It happens both quickly and painfully slowly, all at the same time. You can't possibly tell me that gladiators are going to flip this back. It seems a impossible. Coast again, but that's it. It's going to be hydration. The last the gladiator on the point. Valiant will win the battle for Los Angeles. The opposing team snatches victory away in a do-or-die tiebreaker. The Gladiators lose. And just like that, it's over for tonight. There's 35 more matches to go in the Overwatch League. This is just one of them. We're going to face them again later on. We have to look forward. We have to get better. But they played really well. They, they have no reason to hang their heads. So, Ian, uh, just a glimmer there for you of what esports in 2018 looked like. Uh, the Overwatch League, interestingly, looking to expand. Uh, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, high on the list of possible new franchises. And, and Overwatch isn't even the biggest game out there. By some estimates, the global esports audience, close to 400 million people. That was a fantastic story. Such an interesting world. But, but Andrew, well, let's talk about the Olympics for a moment. You know, faster, <laughs> higher, stronger, as talented as these gamers are, they are sitting in front of their computers. Yeah, yeah I do. That was the part that was going to get you. So uh, for sure, you know, that is something that the IOC has to grapple with, right? Does a person playing a computer game fit with what people believe an Olympian uh, should embody? I mean, right. you have to figure there'd be pretty intense backlash, right? Or, or at least mocking if they made it an Olympic sport. And also uh, consider these are often violent games too, mm -hmm. right? People shooting each other. Is that in the Olympic spirit? I'll say this, here's the flip side. I mean, consider why we're seeing more extreme sports in the Olympics. I mean, half pipe, ski cross, big air, brand new event this year. It's a play to attract a younger audience. And if that's the goal, to stay relevant, to make money, esports might be the next ticket out. All right, I'll think about that. And as I think about it, <laughs> I'll go deeper on the stories of the day. Earlier in the day, you can subscribe to our newsletter at cbcnews.ca slash The National. The National Today takes you inside our journalism every afternoon. On The National Tonight, Harvey Weinstein's company says it is headed for bankruptcy after the collapse of a last-ditch $500 million deal. The company has been trying to find a buyer since dozens of women came forward with sexual misconduct allegations against the now disgraced Hollywood producer. To date, Weinstein has been accused by more than 60 women he has denied having non-consensual sex. Also tonight, a new report is shedding light on the extent of the damage caused by the now discredited mother risk hair testing program in Ontario. The report comes after a two-year review of more than 1,200 child protection cases. The test was used at a Toronto facility between 1990 and 2015 to determine if parents were using drugs and alcohol. But the science behind it has been proven to be flawed. Of the cases reviewed, 56 of them involved families being broken apart as a result of the testing. 
there was scant regard for due process. People experienced the testing, particularly repeated te testing, as intrusive, stigmatizing, demoralizing, and demeaning. The Mother Risk Commission made 32 recommendations in its report, including changes to the way expert evidence is used in child protection cases. Ontario's government says it plans to set up a task force to help implement some of those changes, and it also says compensation for families affected may be possible. Okay, Andrew, now to some real Olympic athletes. By any measure, Canada did spectacularly well at the PyeongChang Olympics. Third place overall with 29 medals. It was our best ever winter performance. Some of those athletes are now home after landing in Toronto earlier today, including fan favorites and romantic rumor topics, Tessa Virtue and Scott Moyer, who gave us our moment of the day. It has been such a special journey for Tess and I. And we've enjoyed uh, it from day one right up until, until these Olympic Games, even on the, the highest stage. And uh, I mean, I think it's an honor for us to be Canadians and to compete as Canadians, but it's pretty personal and special to us uh, as well as partners, skating partners, and skating partners. <laughs> <laughs> that may have been, of course, because there are a whole bunch of Canadians that just need them to be actually a couple and get married. But they are ridiculously adorable. Um, and, and I have to say, a, I know a lot more people that love him now, too, because they've sort of seen the real him with the beer at the hockey game. And so, yeah, they're still cute. I'm curious to see if they can leverage the fame they have in the United States. And I was just down in the States last week. They have a huge profile there. Yeah. Will they be one of the few uh, Olympic, Canadian Olympic athletes to do very well in terms of endorsements south of the border? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And, and let's not forget, of course, Olympic athletes coming home. Uh, the start of a whole new chapter, the Paralympics set to kick off in Pyeongchang, March 9th, 55 athletes going from Canada. Uh, and hey, I'll, I'll plug our network. CBC is the place to watch it, so I hear. Well done. <laughs> That's the National for February 26th. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.